you're walking into fancy steakhouse with whomever it might be, your spouse, a business partner, a colleague, whatever it might be, you need to know how to choose the perfect steak. Today, I'm gonna show you how to choose the perfect steak and clarify a little bit on some different types of steaks to help you make a better decision so that when that cut winds up on your plate in front of you, you know exactly what you're gonna get. Right here in front of me, I have beef porterhouse. I have a beef T-bone. I also have a strip and a filet. I want to show you what makes these filet and strip T-bone and porterhouse. Behind me, I have an entire half of beef. I have a front quarter and I have a hind quarter. The porterhouse and T-bone, those come from the hind quarter. And in this hind quarter, we have a sirloin and we have a short loin. In the short loin, this is where we have porterhouse and T-bone. If we make this boneless and we remove this vertebrae, located right behind this kidney suet, we have the tenderloin, which we can cut into fillets. And when we make it boneless, this back portion here is the strip steaks. So without further ado, let's just get breaking down this hind quarter. I'm gonna show you porterhouse T-bone versus filet and strip. First hind quarter, we're gonna cut, cut porterhouse and T-bone. I have another hind quarter hanging in the cooler. We're gonna cut filet and strip. Start off by removing this rose meat off this flank steak. We're gonna pull our flank. We're gonna pull our sirloin tip. This is where the tri-tip is located. Right here at the top of this loin, you can see this piece right here, this is the very top of the tenderloin. So that's where the tenderloin starts. Want to make sure that we don't get into that tenderloin and make any big gashes in it when we, as we pull this sirloin slash tri-tip out of here. Same thing with removing this kidney suet. This is right behind this suet is where the tenderloin is. So we want to be extremely careful that we don't cut into it. Revealing that nice tenderloin right there. Now we leave this suet in this animal during the dry aging process because as you could see, that fat protects that meat. So if we pulled this out of there earlier in the dry aging process, that would expose all that meat and the air would get to it and it would discolor and it would dry out and it just wouldn't make as nice of a product in the end. We want to separate this sirloin from this round portion. There's a ball joint right here, so we want to go ahead and make a cut across the top of that sirloin. Grab our handsaw. So what we have here is we have the sirloin and we have the short loin. Like I mentioned earlier, porterhouse, T-bone, filet, and strip steak. This one, we're gonna cut into porterhouse and T-bone. The second hind quarter, we're gonna do filet and strip. Went ahead and grabbed the second hind quarter out of the cooler. 
I'm gonna bust this loin off of here, the sirloin, the short loin. That way I can get it on my table and I'll show you the exact comparison between these two loins and how we break them apart. We have our two beef loins. This one, we're gonna do porterhouse and T-bone. That's gonna require the bandsaw. This one, we're gonna do all boneless filet and strip. It's gonna require just a little bit of bandsaw work, but more bandsaw work on this one. So without further ado, let's get started with the bandsaw. First thing I wanna do is I wanna break the sirloin portion off of the short loin. Removing some of the tail. Removing the spinal cord. I've got my short loin all squared up. We're ready to start cutting porterhouse and T-bone. And as you can see, I have a real nice portion of that filet right here. And then we're gonna have that T-bone shape in that vertebrae and then this part's going to be the strip side so the strip side and the fillet side you have those two connected we have a porterhouse steak now let me shut the saw off for a second the usda requirement for a porterhouse steak is you must have at least 1.25 inches of width of that fillet in the steak to be considered a porterhouse so if you go to a restaurant and you go to the butcher and he sells you or she sells you a port, what's supposed to be a porterhouse steak and it does not have at least 1.25 inches of tenderloin filet in that steak, technically it's not a porterhouse. So something to keep in mind. And this video is all about educating you, the consumer, so in the end you get a better product. Let's get started cutting porterhouse and T-bone steaks. We're gonna go about an inch and a quarter on these. That's a nice thickness for us. It's what most of our customers prefer. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six quarter house and six T-bone off of that one short loin. Now the other thing to remember is that when you buy a steak like this, this portion right here would be considered the tail. So you, as you can see, I've trimmed this steak up real nice and I didn't leave a bunch of tail on there. Just remember, um, you know, if, if there's three or four inches of a tail on here and maybe it's curled around inside the package, you are in fact paying for that excess uh, weight. So we like to remove that, give our customers um, you know, more edible product. I'm gonna trim the, a little bit of fat off of these. This one right here could technically be considered, um, it's more like two inches. So technically this one would be considered a porterhouse, but um, today we're gonna go ahead and call it a T-bone. Like I said, we want our customers to have the best experience possible when it comes to purchasing cooking and enjoying products that they buy here in our shop. I'm just removing this bone dust with my scraper. Whenever these are displayed in our meat cases, you certainly don't want to leave this on there. It's just poor, poor presentation. Somebody's going to be paying, you know, this amount for a steak. You want it to be presented accordingly. There's a half a dozen perfectly cut porterhouse steaks. Let's get them laid out on the table. Here's the porterhouse. Next, same thing, half a dozen, inch and a quarter, dandy T-bone steaks. There you have the bone-in version of a short loin, porterhouse, T-bone. Now, the next one, it's gonna be boneless, it's gonna be filet and strip.
So you can see I have the sirloin chunk right here off that first loin. So you can do a couple different things with this. And today it's not about sirloin, but I have to mention it because it's sitting here. Someone's going to ask. I can either leave the bone in this and do a bone in sirloin, um, or I can remove the bone. And then I have this chunk of tenderloin right here. I can cut into, into uh, fillets. I can leave it whole, whatever. Um, or uh, when I make it boneless, I'm going to have a boneless sirloin. This is also right here, this cap, that is where your picanha comes from. So just a little FYI on that chunk right there. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and make this boneless and I'm going to cut filet and sirloin. But for the sake of the video, that's not going to be today because that's a different one. We're going to focus on this one right here. And we're going to start by removing this tenderloin. By doing that, get our fingers in there, start separating these seams out. You can see I started the whole process with barely even any knife work at all, just using my fingers. You want to use the tip of that knife, staying nice and close to that bone, working our way all the way down this vertebrae. Start down here at the tail. Let's just work this whole tenderloin right out. Making sure we get as much of that as we possibly can. So there you have an untrimmed beef tenderloin. In the commercial industry, this would be, cons would be called a Pismo peeled side muscle on. So this is the side muscle. So depending on how you buy this, you can buy it like this untrimmed or you can buy it trimmed. That one would be considered an untrimmed whole beef tenderloin. Now I want to remove this sirloin from the strip section. Start by making a cut, finding this joint using some downward pressure on my table, separate the sirloin from the strip, letting gravity do its work. And you can see now the difference between these two. That one has a chunk of filet in it. That one doesn't because I left it as part of that whole tenderloin. Now this is where I mentioned earlier, I am going to have to use a little bit of bandsaw work. I'm going to go ahead and remove these vertebrae bones. I'm going to remove the tail, get them both back here on the table, and we'll start fabricating them. Let's trim up the tenderloin. I'll get this cut into some filet mignons. Here again, a lot of this can be pulled off by hand, but your initial start needs to be done with your knife. Just pull that off like that. So something here to remember too, if you go to your local butcher or your grocery store and you want to buy a beef filet, you know, pay attention to how it's trimmed because here again, you know, if it has a lot of the fat or the side muscle left on that steak, you are in fact paying for that. So just keep that in mind. We trim our fillets uh, really clean. We take all the silver skin and every, all the, you know, unwanted fat and gristle and things like that off of them. So just get my knife underneath this silver skin. Trimming it up like this. Something else you might see is you might see what's called a center cut filet. This portion right here from the, the top down here to the tail, the center, center part, this would be considered your, your center cut. But today we're going to cut this whole entire tenderloin into some nice thick, let's say about an inch and a half thick fillets. 
super tender, not a lot of marbling as to be expected. Just some real nice beef filet mignons. So typically what we find, a lot of ladies like this cut because there's, it's, it's very clean cut. There's not a lot of gristle or bone or anything like that to work around. So ladies, you go to the restaurant, you're gonna maybe wanna ask for a filet mignon because pretty hard to beat. Now something you have to remember is that there is not a lot of that intermuscular fat, that marbling. So when it comes to flavor, yes, beef tenderloin, beef filet is very uh, tender, great mouthfeel. But when it comes to a nice beefy flavor, if you're looking for that fat, because fat we all know is flavor, you may not find quite as much in a beef filet, let's say compared to like a ribeye or something like that. Beef strip, this is a strip loin otherwise sometimes known as a New York strip. We call them just a simple strip steak here in the store. So we're gonna go ahead and remove these bones. And these are the bones that would be, if we left them in the porterhouse and T-bone, would create that, that T-shape inside the steak. So if we cut this in half, it would, it would be that T. So we just wanna remove these bones. down like that. I want to remove the back of this vertebrae. All the way down. Use the tip of our knife and our thumb. If you put your thumb right on top of this little bone, you can work that little piece right out of that strip loin without making a, a big mess of it and hacking into it as you go. There you have it. All the bones have been removed. So beef strip steaks, New York strips, loin strips, there's a lot of different names for these. Um, but like I said, this is a boneless beef loin, also known as a strip steak. We're gonna start by squaring this end up. We're gonna cut a nice inch and a quarter move just a little bit of that fat on there. Now, if I don't want to go through and trim each individual steak, all I have to do is, is flip this over and take a little bit of that back fat off as a whole loin. And that's going to save me from going through each individual steak and trimming each steak. So just keep in mind, if you're a meat cutter, you're working in this industry, pre-trim your loins. It's just going to save you in the end from going back through and trimming each steak. Knife's just gliding through there. Some nice tender steaks, I have no doubt. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. We got 12 steaks on, of the bone inversion. We had six porterhouse and six T bone. And we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We have eight fillets and we have 10 strips when we made this boneless. So just to clarify, let's talk about something here for a minute. If you're getting a beef processed at your local butcher, let's say he's gonna custom process that for you. Let's say you're getting a half of a beef. Just remember, you have two options when it comes to cutting that short loin. You can do the bone in, porterhouse and T-bone, or you can do the boneless filet and strip. If you ask him for porterhouse and T-bone, you get your meat home, you unload it in your freezer, and then all of a sudden you say, well, where's my filet and strip? You in fact have it, but you did ask for the bone in version. So keep that in mind. The butcher isn't keeping your filets. He's not keeping your strip steaks. You just simply ask for a different version of that cut. So just an FYI. Let's add the strip steaks to our collection over here on the table. We're starting to get a nice uh, 
layout going. It's looking pretty. If you had a summer barbecue and you showed up and your the host had this lying out on the table, you would be in uh, for a real treat. Adding our fillets to our pile. It's like we're gonna run one short. And the reason being is like I cut these fillets thicker than I did the strips because most people want a uh, fillet cut thicker than say a porterhouse T-bone or a strip. So I'd also like to mention that, you know, here again, if you're ordering beef and you ask for a two inch thick steak and you wonder why you got less steaks on say half of a beef, it's because you got them thicker. If I cut these in half, I would have wound up with twice as many fillets. Common sense here, folks. So the butcher isn't always the bad guy. Sometimes it's just a mis miscommunication between the customer and the one delivering the, the end result. On the table, now that we're all laid out, porterhouse, T-bone, fillet, and strip. And you can see, let's just take this one for instance, let's just lay it right on the steak. Now that you can see that that bone's been removed, see that T in there? There's the filet, there's the strip. Make sense now? Porterhouse T-bone versus filet and strip. When you go to the restaurant, hopefully this educates you a little bit. You can order better, you know, Maybe you don't want to mess around with the bone. I mentioned earlier, the ladies like these. Dudes do too, let's be honest, they're tender. Sean eats fillets. <laughs> so, but we only, we only let him have one just occasionally. He does a good enough job that he can eat a fillet once or two a year. So, you know, maybe, uh, maybe you want to go to the store, maybe you want to buy a porterhouse steak. So go ahead and buy a porterhouse steak like this. Remove the bone yourself after it's been cooked, then you all, then at that point you have a his and hers or however you want to do it, and you can each enjoy a nice steak. So in our opinion, economically, you want to go out and buy a steak. You see a porterhouse steak in the, in the restaurant or the store. It's a great option. You kind of get the best of both worlds. So just keep that in mind. You're also paying for the bone, therefore, the price is gonna be reflected in these. They are boneless. You're gonna be paying slightly more. The tenderloin, the filet, of course, the highly sought after, the most tender piece of meat on the carcass. So I went over the filet and strip on the, on the porterhouse. Now if we compare this to say a T-bone, you have that strip portion on there, but you just don't have that. I mean, there's a little portion of that filet, but not a lot of it. So. There again, if you order a T-bone steak and you wonder why you're not getting that portion of that filet in there, that's the reason why, because technically, by USDA standards, this is a T-bone steak, not a porterhouse. Hopefully, that with today's cutting, we wanted to do a simple video, not a super long video, to better educate you when it comes to going to the store, going to the butcher shop, cutting it yourself, or going to the restaurant. Hopefully you learned something, hopefully you enjoy. Don't forget, follow us on the, all of our platforms, Facebook, Instagram, you know the deal. Hit that bell for notifications. Don't forget to subscribe, and don't forget, there's more to come, so stay tuned. See you next time.